Hey everybody, it's Mr. Matthew here. In this video, we're gonna focus in on Gregor Mendel uh, and how his work led to our modern understanding of genetics and inheritance. And we'll talk a little bit about the experiments he conducted with pea plants. I'll then get into how those experiments led to Mendel's laws. Within this video, I'll also provide a link to another video about how to solve Punnett squares. This is something many of you guys probably already know, but uh, it is a good thing to review. Uh, some people will need more review than others, but I will also include a separate link for how to solve Punnett squares and some simple examples there. All right, here we go. So uh, this right here is an image uh, not of Mr. Hone. Seriously not of Mr. Hone, but of Gregor Mendel. So Gregor Mendel, Austrian monk, mathematician, and a science teacher, math teacher. And what did he do? Well, Gregor Mendel, amongst his many exploits, uh, is a plant breeder. He conducted a whole lot of experiments where he crossed pea plants. And so what did he do when he crossed pea plants? He would go and get different varieties of plants. So for example, there is a purple flower variety of pea plants, and there is a white variety of pea plants. And what he did is he crossed the two of those, and he produced what? So here, I want you to take a moment, and I want you to pause and think, what do you think the color of the pea plants were after he crossed the purple flowers with the white flowers. Pause and think. All right, so hopefully you had a chance to think about that. So what happened when Mendel crossed the purple flowers with white flowers? He got nothing but purple flowers. And you might have been thinking, well, maybe they would be purple flowers because you've already learned about Mendel, and maybe you thought they'd be white flowers because you learned about Mendel, but you didn't know what was dominant and recessive. And then maybe you thought it would be like a light purple flower because you thought there'd be some sort of blending that would have occurred. It's not 100% clear what Mendel thought at the time, but it was pretty much proposed that blending a uh, form of genetics was thought to have existed before Mendel's time. So it's likely that he thought that he was going to get like a light purple flower, but he didn't get that. He got a deep purple flower. And we know from the readings of other scientists of his time, for example, Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin was a big supporter of the blending hypothesis. So I would say Charles Darwin would have proposed that you would have gotten sort of a light purple flower that would have been a blend between the two. But that's not what he got. So then this leads to the next question. Well, all right, what happened here? Well, the first thing that we'd say is that this came up to the idea of dominance, that somehow the, the color that was in purple and the color that is white are not equal when you make the cross, and that that purple flower ends up being dominant and the white color ends up being recessive. So this is the law of dominance, that when you cross two plants um, and have Mendelian style traits, one of the phenotypes is going to be expressed in the next generation and the other will not. The one that is expressed when you cross true breeding for the two different varieties, the one that gets expressed in these crosses is known as dominant, and the one that's not expressed is known as recessive. So a dominant trait is expressed when present, and a recessive trait is only expressed when there's no dominant present. That's a simple definition of dominant and recessive. And so Mendel didn't just stop with key flowers. He caught across lots of different characteristics, and he saw this pretty consistently, that when he crossed gray and round pea seeds with white and wrinkled ones uh, in terms of the seed coat, he would only get one variety. Yellow and green, he would only get one variety. A full with a constricted only gets one variety. Yellow with green pods, only one variety. Location of the flowers um, or the height of the plant, again, only one variety ends up holding out. So now this leads to the question, well, what happens when we take these offspring here, these purple results from the cross of purple and white, we take that next generation, which we call the F1 generation, and we cross that. And so that's what he did. And so it turns out that when he crossed purple with purple from that F1, that 75% of the next generation ended up being purple and 25% ended up being white. And this led to the idea of the law of segregation. And so the law of segregation says that when a, an individual has two separate alleles, it's going to separate those during meiosis. So if you remember from the last video, we talked about meiosis and we have this diploid plant, one that has two copies of the gene. So in these F1 parents, I look up here, it's big A, little a. 
And so what we see here is that when it goes to pass on the genes, sometimes it's going to pass on a big A, but sometimes it's going to pass on a little a. The other parent is the same way. Sometimes it passes on a big A and sometimes it passes on a little a. We use this probability of half the time passing on the big A, half the time of passing on a little a, and we use these gametes from this F1 to fill out this Punnett square. And then when we fill in the Punnett square, it gives us a probability of the offspring. And so then down below in this F2, we see that the genotypes of the offspring are one big A, big A, two big A, little a, and one little a, little a. And we see the phenotypes of these offspring as being three purple and one white. And so the fact that the big A and little a separate from one another when we form uh, the gametes, this is known as the law of segregation. The third law that we're going to talk about for Mendel is the law of independent assortment. And in this case, what we see is that we have a individual that's big R, little r, big Y, little y, I cross with another individual that's big R, little r, big Y, little y. And so just to look at the diagram on the bottom, you'll see that um, big R stands for green uh, pods, little r is yellow pods, big Y is for constricted pods, and little y, uh, y is smooth pods. And when I've got this individual that's big R, little r, big Y, little y, there's an equal chance that I'll pass on a big R and a, an equal chance that I'll pass on a little r. That's our law of segregation. But not only that, the big R and the big Y do not influence each other. So every time I pass on a big R, I could pass on a big Y, but I could just as easily pass on a little Y. This means an individual that's big R, little r, big Y, little Y has four possible gametes that it can produce. And so that's actually what we see in this diagram along the top we see that this female uh, is going to produce little r, little y a quarter of the time, big r, big y a quarter of the time, little r, big y a quarter of the time, and big r, little y a quarter of the time. And you'll see the male along um, our right-hand column is exactly the same, those same four gametes it will produce. As a result, when I fill these in, we get nine individuals that show both dominant traits. In this case, the green color and the constricted pod shape. We will see three individuals that will show dominance for color, meaning green, but they'll show the recessive shape, in this case, the smooth shape. And so you'll see that there are three that show that. There are three individuals that will show recessive color and dominant shape. And there's one individual out of the 16 that will show recessive for both color and shape. All right. So this is the law of independent assortment that the two separate genes that we're looking for are going to end up not influencing, influencing each other. There are a few interesting exceptions to this, but this in, in this case, we're talking about genes that are on separate chromosomes will always assort independently like this. All right. Uh, here is a link if you would like to review some of the ways in which you can solve simple Punnett square problems. Uh, these are mostly the monohybrid crosses, but I'll include a link right here to a video on how to solve Punnett squares. It will also review a lot of the key vocabulary that I've talked about in this genotype, phenotype, dominant, recessive, and that sort of thing. And that is the other video that is associated with this particular section of homework. All right. I hope that's helpful and I'll talk to everybody soon.